Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Artificial Intelligence for Earth System Science Summer School. Uh, I'm your moderator for today, uh, David John Gagne. Uh, our focus for today will be on deep learning uh, and its all its varied flavors and and uh, all the kind of exciting things you can do with it in the Earth System Sciences. So our uh, I'd like to, we'll have uh, three speakers. Uh, there'll be a, a ten minute break uh, after e after each uh, speaker. Uh, so we'll we'll have our first speaker now, and then at ten ten, and then eleven twenty. So so if you if you want to come back uh, to the to the live stream, that that's a good time to do so. And again, we'll also have a panel this afternoon at uh, one twenty, uh, as well as a hackathon update after that. So you'll get to. Uh, we we got a lot of questions yesterday. I expect to get a lot more today, so we'll we'll try to get in as many as we can through throughout the period. Uh, so let's we'll go ahead and kick things off. Our first speaker today is uh, Dr. Karthik Kashinath from NERSC, and he'll be talking about an introduction to deep learning. So now we're going to turn it over to him. Thank you, David. And welcome back, everyone, to the second day of this summer school. Uh, today, we take a deep dive into deep learning, and you'll learn all about neural networks and how they're trained and how they're optimized and how they're used for uh, various different tasks in, in the art sciences. Uh, this is a fairly uh, involved topic, but hopefully you'll hear a few versions of deep learning through the day uh, and reiterate some of these points as we go through uh, and also get a lot of experience from your hands-on exercises. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Mustafa, who is a deep learning uh, expert and scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. These are slides that we've created over the last uh, year or so, and uh, some credits go to Mustafa for creating the slides as well. Um, I work at NERSC and this is uh, the supercomputing center at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, we've been developing deep learning methods and machine learning algorithms and various different techniques for uh, the climate sciences for the last few years and I'll uh, give you a few snapshots of uh, applications as well as we get towards the end. So. Deep learning is all over the place right now and I'm sure uh, many of you have heard about the various different success stories, but I just wanted to quickly highlight a few of the ones that really stand out. Um, a recent one is Robotic Agents uh, by Dexterity, uh, which came out in OpenAI in 2019. Uh, robots these days use deep learning for various different tasks, and although it might seem like those are very different from the types of applications that we have in the earth sciences, there actually are many parallels, and uh, part of the the job for earth scientists is to figure out how to translate some of these problems uh, in sort of the industry and, and various other disciplines to uh, problems in the earth sciences. On the right is a, a, gen, a faces generated using something called generative adversarial networks. And these are, um, these are networks that uh, compete against each other. Uh, I won't get into the details of it right now, but uh, what I'm showing here is that deep neural networks are capable of uh, emulating characteristics of natural images and, and likely emulating characteristics of uh, actual uh, data on the Earth as well. Um, we'll. We'll have some examples towards the end. Uh, it's quite incredible that these networks are able to produce uh, images that essentially are indistinguishable from real images and have very high resolution, all the characteristics that you expect in these images and so on. So that's probably a great new way of uh, producing data that um, uh, essentially emulates the characteristics of Earth systems, but doesn't actually require the computational power of simulating them. Um, the next is success stories in self-driving cars. Uh, this is again all over the news and we've heard about this in uh, various different ways over the last couple of years. But essentially the tasks are uh, pattern recognition of various sorts, uh, object detection, segmentation and so on. 
Uh, and once again, we'll see as we go through the week that many of these are also extremely useful for things like extreme weather detection in large data sets, uh, classifying types of patterns, uh, say remote sensing and so on. On the right is also some very creative applications of deep learning uh, in the arts and in music. Uh, deep learning is able to create um, paintings and audios and various other pieces of text and literature that is uh, very creative and potentially very compelling. So the same can be thought of in terms of the sciences where we might be able to, to detect new patterns and create new data that have characteristics that we care about. Uh, these are some success stories in science. Uh, on the top left is cancer detection. Um, Deep neural, network, deep neural networks have been used to uh, detect various types of cancers uh, in cancerous tissues, uh, doing segmentation on extremely large data sets. Uh, it's also been used in astrophysics and cosmology for uh, mapping out the universe. Uh, all types of galaxies across the universe have been uh, mapped out in, to, to very great detail using uh, deep neural networks. Also been used to predict protein structures, uh, very complex geometries, and, and all kinds of protein folding. Uh, something that's closer to home on the bottom left is land cover segmentation. So essentially uh, doing pixel-wise classification. So every single pixel of your data set is classified into different types of uh, land cover uh, or land, land categories. Uh, the same can be done in the ocean, in the atmosphere, and elsewhere. Uh, and the bottom right is drug discovery, which is uh, being able to create different molecules of different characteristics, uh, solving inverse problems and so on. Uh, there's many, many more success stories in science. Uh, almost every day we have multiple papers coming out in uh, the top journals, including Nature and Science, on how deep neural networks are transforming the way we do science. Uh, and hopefully by the end of this school, you'll be motivated to uh, use deep learning for some of your own research. So yesterday we had uh, a fairly detailed description of machine learning, various different types of machine learning models, uh, and how they can be applied to the art sciences. Uh, I just wanted to distinguish uh, and sort of map out what deep learning is compared to machine learning. Uh, deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Uh, it is one of the many different ways in which machine learning can be done. Uh, of course, it use, uses neural networks. The word deep there refers to the fact that these neural networks have many layers, so they're deep. Uh, as again, shallow learning in which uh, you have neural networks with a few layers. The key difference, however, is uh, as you see on the top, uh, you have inputs, which uh, could be an image of a car, or it could be uh, climate data, or it could be other types of data from sensors and so on. Uh, there is uh, a person sitting there on a laptop, which is essentially the scientist in our case, that's extracting features. So the engineering that needs to be done, that's the pre-processing. Uh, and then that goes into the neural network, in this case, a shallow network, or it could be any of the other machine learning models that we talked about yesterday, random forests, uh, trees, various other uh, support vector machines and so on. Uh, and then finally, you have an output, which is whatever the task is, uh, in this case, uh, classifying it as a car or not a car. The key difference with deep learning is that uh, the feature extraction is done by the network itself. So the deep neural network has sufficient capacity and sufficient complexity to be able to extract the features that matter for the particular task. The catch, however, is that you have to provide lots of training data. Uh, this is a very data hungry problem. Uh, you do need to provide high quality training data in order to essentially teach the network what the key features are that are useful for this particular task. Uh, however, we've, uh, in the last few years that there are many different ways of optimizing these networks and uh, essentially assisting them and helping them learn the right features. Uh, this does not mean that the scientist is not useful anymore. Uh, as, as David and others emphasized yesterday, uh, almost 80% of the problem is the data preparation and the pre-processing. Uh, the training and learning process is only 20%. So a lot of work goes into uh, determining exactly how you pre-process the data, what types of networks you might construct, how you might provide additional support to your network by uh, constraining it in certain ways or baking in certain principles about the scientific data that you have and so on. Uh, so the outline for today's talk is uh, fairly elaborate. Um, 
we will go through the uh, basics of neural networks, uh, ways of optimizing and training these networks, uh, monitoring the training process, convolutional neural networks, uh, which is all over the place for image recognition and various other tasks. If I have time, I'll try to get to data normalization, learning rate decay, and batch size schedule, uh, which are important for the optimization process. How you might go about improving the generalization of your model, which is the key task of learning. Uh, the key difference is that you want to generalize to an unseen data set to the real world as against just uh, producing good results on your training data. Uh, and there's many ways of doing that. Uh, I'll, if I get a chance, I'll get to uh, the challenges and importance of having deep networks and, and how you might uh, change the depth of the network and so on. Transfer learning is something that uh, I might not get to today, but we will have uh, talks later on in the week uh, which discuss uh, how transfer learning can be done, and then finally some practical tips. Uh, so my goal is that in the uh, next hour or so to cover the basics, and um, as we go through the week and, and the other talks today, we'll get to some of the more uh, advanced topics. And finally, uh, I'll go off with some practical tips, but uh, the, the hackathon is the best place for you to uh, pick up all of these uh, skills and techniques as you go through solving these problems. Um, it's impossible to, to give a complete and comprehensive and detailed overview of deep learning in 50 minutes. Uh, so I must say that there's really no replacement to taking a slightly more detailed uh, look into deep learning. The CS231N course at Stanford University, uh, which is all online and all the material is available, is perhaps the most comprehensive and complete course uh, that exists. There's many others as well. Uh, a lot of the slides that we have in this talk are also from some of these lectures, so I do recommend that. On the top right are two books, uh, the Deep Learning Textbook by Ian Goodfellow and others. Uh, that really is sort of the classic uh, textbook for this uh, topic, and I, it's very readable and I highly recommend it. Uh, and for uh, practical hands-on tips with uh, getting started and getting all the uh, techniques of optimizing and training these networks, uh, Deep Learning with Python uh, by Francois Chalet is a good book as well. On the bottom right uh, is distill.pub. Um, today, machine learning and deep learning are exploding. Uh, well, they've been exploding for the last few years. And there's you know, hundreds of papers coming out in, in machine learning and deep learning research every single day. Uh, it's impossible for anyone to actually absorb all of that material. Uh, distill.pub is sort of this great service uh, where deep learning experts and machine learning experts synthesize and summarize uh, the latest and greatest research uh, in machine learning uh, into clear, dynamic, and vivid, um, essentially blog posts uh, with lots of graphics and videos and tools and help. So I highly recommend distill.pub as well for uh, diving into certain topics, for example, on interpretability or gen generative adversarial networks and, and so on. So neural networks are not new. Uh, they've been around for quite a while, going all the way back to the 50s with the perceptron uh, by Rosenblatt. In the 70s, uh, there was backpropagation, the algorithm that's used for uh, training and optimization. In the 90s, we had the LSTMs come out. Uh, but it's only in the last, say, decade that deep learning has really exploded and become very useful uh, in the industry and also in academia. And we'll see exactly why that's happened in the last few years. But uh, it was only in 2015 that ResNet came out. So uh, it's only five years ago that deep learning sort of uh, shot into fame. Uh, and we'll see why. So why do deep neural networks finally work now? Uh, as I mentioned, these are data hungry uh, types of problems. Uh, deep neural networks need and they can essentially crunch through more and more and more data. There's a power law that says you can keep going uh, and reducing your error as you have more and more data. Uh, and we are in, in, the, data, in the data age. Uh, we do have um, petabytes of data in, in climate science uh, and probably petabytes coming in every single year uh, with the observations, the reanalysis, the uh, climate model output and so on. Um, and so we're actually perfectly poised for using deep learning because uh, we have extremely large amounts of data in the earth sciences. Uh, on the right is uh, GPUs and linear algebra accelerators. Uh, you'll see as we go through uh, the talk today and, and various other talks that deep learning has large amounts of matrix computations and 
GPUs are uh, classic machines that are designed for very fast linear algebra. Uh, and GPUs essentially came out in the last uh, decade or so, uh, less than that. And we see in this graph here that the for one of the uh, competitions, uh, deep learning competitions that existed uh, for a few years, shows that uh, the error dropped significantly as soon as GPUs were used uh, for these competitions. And that happened uh, in 2013. And in the blue curve, we see the number of GPUs used. And on the red is the error rate dropping uh, drastically. And then finally, uh, we've also had significant al algorithmic uh, advances, um, optimizers, regularization techniques, normalization, et cetera. So there are uh, computer scientists working hard day in and day out to improve these methods of optimizing uh, in order to actually make these deep neural networks work. So what are deep neural networks? Uh, this is a, a one sentence summary of what deep neural networks are. Uh, they are a family of parametric, nonlinear, and hierarchical representation learning functions, which are massively optimized with stochastic gradient descent to encode domain knowledge, domain inferences, stationarity, and so on. Now that's quite a mouthful. Uh, but I'll try to unpack that through the, uh, the rest of this hour. Uh, the key idea is that you're trying to learn these representations of various complex functions in your data set for specific tasks. And you're also trying to encode the domain knowledge that exists in the data set to, in order to solve these tasks. We'll come back to this at the end of the talk and see how we've actually understood uh, the different parts of this definition. So diving into the basics, Deep feed-forward neur feed neural networks are uh, sort of the first simplest example of deep neural networks. Uh, the key is to uh, optimize a function. Uh, the objective of the neural network is to essentially have this function y equals f star x. Uh, the neural network is trying to learn an approximate function f with certain parameters w, which are the weights. x are your inputs, y is your input. Uh, the function is essentially defined by your task. Uh, the key idea is that you can compose this into uh, simpler and simpler functions. So you can have a decomposition of this very complex F star into multiple decompositions of simpler functions. And what are those simpler functions? A uh, common choice for this sort of simple atomic function is an affine transformation followed by a nonlinearity. Now, I'll explain what that means. An affine transformation is essentially just a linear transformation. Uh, so if we were to compose many different linear transformations, one on top of the other, ultimately you'll end up with a linear transformation, which is not extremely helpful. So you do need to have a nonlinearity, uh, and that is provided by the activation function phi. So W here is your weights, which is the linear part, and that is acting on the inputs. There's a bias, which might shift from, say, zero, for example. Uh, and that's passed through an activation by gives you activation, uh, an activation function phi, which gives you an activation uh, which is nonlinear. Now, the trick is that you compose these into many, many layers. And ultimately, when you have this massive composition of these many simple functions, you can learn very complex tasks. So the optimization procedure is used to find these network parameters, the weights w's and the biases b, that best approximate the relationship in the data which is essentially the learning process. So a little bit of terminology. Uh, you have your input layer, which is all of your inputs x. Uh, as they go through these functions, uh, you get uh, activations, which are the features. These go into hidden layers, uh, and there could be multiple hidden layers. Uh, in this case, we have hidden layer one and two. Followed by that, uh, you have the output layer, which gives you your outputs. Uh, the weights are the different Ws, uh, and there's millions of these weights in these deep neural networks. Uh, one particular neuron is this hidden unit, uh, which is where the um, transformation happens. So the activation functions are, are shown here. Uh, the inputs X uh, with uh, the weights Ws give you the weighted sum, and that passes through the activation function to give you an activation O. This is uh, essentially loosely modeled on uh, biological neurons, where you have dendrites that are uh, picking up input signals. They go into the cell nucleus, and then the neuron uh, fires. The firing process is essentially the activation uh, giving you output signals. So this is uh, the whole idea is sort of 
loosely based on biological neurons. Of course, if you talk to neuroscientists, they will argue that this is oversimplified, which is true, uh, but that's where the terminology comes from. The pre is the weighted sum, a little more terminology, uh, which is the weight scale, uh, the input scale by the weights. Uh, that goes into the activation function, and what comes out of the activation function is your actual activation O. What are these activation functions? Um, they are essentially functions that provide nonlinearities, but they could be provided in many different ways. Uh, on the top left is sigmoid, which is a smooth function between zero and one, so you might use this for probabilities. Uh, you could have a tan H, which is also smooth and has different properties. Uh, most commonly used is the ReLU, uh, which is on the bottom left, which is a rec uh, rectified linear unit, uh, which essentially is bi bilinear or sort of uh, discontinuous linear in that it's uh, linear in the positive side and zero on, on the negative side. The leaky ReLU allows a little bit of the negative part to come through. Uh, we'll see why we might use something like that. There's also many other types of activations. Uh, for this, I'm just going to focus on ReLU, and uh, we might get to some of the others as we go along. Uh, the sigmoid and tan H are often used for output layers, and, and you might um, intuitively see why, because you might want to have smooth outputs or probabilities. Uh, but we can get into the details of activations if we do have some time towards the end. Uh, I think that's good for a, an introduction. So what are the kinds of functions that neural networks can approximate? Um, thankfully, we have the universal approximation theorem, uh, which is now about 30 years ago, uh, which states that a single hidden layer neural network with a linear output unit can approximate any continuous function arbitrarily well given enough hidden units. Now, this is essentially an existence theorem, which says that you can, you can approximate any complex function, any nonlinear function, any relationship between the outputs and the inputs arbitrarily well given, given enough hidden units. So you might need to have extremely large number of hidden units, but uh, what this says is that there is uh, a particular function that can be approximated uh, using this theorem. So this is an existence theorem, but not necessarily uh, showing you how exactly you might find that neural network or find that combination of hidden units. Uh, so obviously the huge task here is how do we go about finding that particular um, neural network or that, that particular combination of hidden units uh, and, and finding out whether it's too large to be practical or not. So the, the second part of this talk is going to be on how we optimize and train neural networks. Uh, but I think I'll pause here for a minute uh, to take any questions. So, uh, are there any short-term programs on the advanced application of deep learning at Berkeley Lab for graduate students? Great question, yes. Uh, we love interns and we're always looking for uh, smart interns to, to join us on various different projects. Uh, I do recommend uh, checking out the uh, webpage for NERSC and for Berkeley Lab. Uh, we do advertise uh, internships there. It is a little too late for the summer. Uh, we're already um, well into the summer, so, uh, I would recommend looking out for the next uh, summer's uh, projects. Uh, we do also have fall interns uh, occasionally, so please do reach out and, and we'll see uh, what opportunities exist. All right. The next is, oh, it's switching alarm quite a lot. Does a human have to decide which activation functions to use? Is that a hyperparameter or something that the neural network itself can inform? That's a great question. Um, there are, uh, there's a lot of research going on into potentially uh, changing activation functions automatically, uh, doing it in hyperparameter optimization. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, you do have to decide beforehand uh, the choice of activation functions. Of course, your weights are being trained and various other hyperparameters are being trained. So you have a lot of other uh, free moving parts. Uh, but to begin with, we'll, we'll see that you can start off with ReLU or Leaky ReLU as, uh, as a good starting point, and then 
uh, you might change to more complex activations uh, as, as you go through the, the training process. Are there partially connected neural networks too? Um, Yes, there are. Uh, I think what you mean by partially connected is networks that are not dense. Uh, we'll see as we go through this talk that uh, you will have various other ways. You can have sparse neural networks. You have um, stripes where you don't necessarily convolve, uh, don't necessarily use all, all neurons uh, in every layer. Uh, and of course, convolutional neural networks uh, are uh, sparse in the sense that they only have certain regions of focus. Um, so we will get to all of that in a moment. And a fine transformation is essentially just a linear function. Um, I guess mathematicians like to call it in different ways. Uh, an activation function is um, essentially what we saw in, in the previous few slides. It is the nonlinear part of the entire process. Uh, it's an activation which is sort of akin to the firing of a neuron. Uh, if the neuron activates, it means it fires, uh, so it gives some output. If it doesn't activate, you have a zero output. Uh, we'll get to GANs as we go along. Uh, I think David Hall later today will also have some nice examples on GANs. Uh, there are many, many references. Uh, I won't have time to cover all of that today, but uh, we do have a lot of uh, recommended reading material. Uh, and you will see examples of GANs as we go along. Okay, I think that's probably good for the moment. There's certainly more questions as we can, uh, we can address as we go along. Uh, Okay, so coming back to the optimizing and training process for neural networks, uh, which is where all the uh, fun exists, so to speak. So let's start off with uh, the optimization. So you do have to first define a cost function in order to optimize a neural network. Uh, the key idea here is that you have a certain prediction f uh, with your inputs x and your weights w. Uh, you compare that to your uh, actual uh, outputs y, and there is a loss function that compares the model predictions to the Perfect. data. Uh, can you share your screen, please? Just a moment. Do you see my screen now? Yes. Thank you. All right, so uh, coming back to the actual definition, uh, apologies for that um, slight tech issue there. Uh, I wasn't quite sharing my screen yet. Uh, but the, uh, the process of training a neural network is uh, essentially defining a cost function and then optimizing it. Um, so we have our function f here, which is operating on the inputs x and the weights w, uh, which gives you the outputs, which are compared to the actual data y. Uh, a loss function is defined by essentially comparing f and y. Uh, there's different types of ways of defining that loss function, we'll, which we'll get into in a moment. Uh, but of course, you want to do this over your entire distribution of the data uh, and average it. So we have the expectation, which is uh, calculating the loss over all of your data points. And finally, you optimize that over many different examples. Uh, the technical term in the, the statistics and machine learning community is, is empirical cost minimization, uh, which is essentially uh, building models that work well on unseen data. Uh, so the key difference between optimization and learning is uh, you optimize on a given data set, but learning is essentially being able to generalize to uh, unseen data. So uh, the goal of uh, learning, of course, is that you generalize to unseen data points so that your model works well on, on new data sets and uh, things that you've not seen before. 
So the true cost would be on P data, uh, but what we want to do is to actually optimize it on uh, the training data set and then uh, hope that it generalizes well to unseen data and we'll see how we can uh, improve that fidelity as we go along. So the empirical cost here is P hat, which is the training data set. Uh, so this entire function is constructed over training data and we'll, we'll see how uh, we can improve the generalization on unseen data sets. So gradient descent is the uh, process by which we actually optimize these parameters. Uh, so the weights Ws are the parameters of your model. Uh, in the case of deep neural networks, you could have millions of parameters uh, and you initially start off either with a random initialization or, or a pre-trained network. Uh, but ultimately you wanna optimize these parameters to do well on the particular task for which you're using the neural network. Uh, so you need to update the weights of the network uh, as the training process proceeds, and that's exactly what gradient descent does. So uh, a very simple tie example is shown on the top right, where you have a loss function, uh, the curve in gray, as a function of some parameters theta. Uh, the learning process is you start off at some random point, uh, which is not at the optimum of the loss function, and you take learning steps that essentially walks you along that loss function curve. Uh, hopefully onto uh, global minimum. In this case, it's obviously a very simple function and it's easy to reach the global minimum. But as we'll see, uh, these, these surfaces, these lost surfaces can be extremely complex uh, in you know, millions of dimensions. And it's very challenging to actually find good optima and we might get stuck in, in local uh, minima and so on. So the update rule here is essentially the learning rate alpha, uh, which tells you the size of the step that you take. Uh, the gradient here is the gradient of the last function. Uh, so you move in the direction opposite of the gradient, meaning that you minimize that particular last function. So your new weights WK plus one are your previous weights uh, with this particular step. Uh, alpha, the learning rate, is also a hyperparameter that we optimize as we go through the training process, the different uh, schedules for optimizing uh, or changing alpha as you go through your training. Uh, so this cartoon shows what the training process looks like uh, for a two-dimensional surface. Again, very simple, as you can see, uh, there is a trajectory that's being taken. Uh, but of course, uh, in reality, these are problems that we're solving in millions of dimensions. Uh, stochastic gradient descent is the sort of workhorse of the optimization for deep neural networks. The key idea is that if we had to do a gradient descent on networks, works with uh, millions or potentially billions of parameters, this would be very computationally expensive. So an approximation to that is to essentially compute the gradient over a random mini batch instead of using the entire data set. Uh, the size of the mini batch here is M. Uh, so you essentially calculate this loss and sum it up over all of your mini batch points. And that gives you an estimate of the gradient. Of course, the mini batch is gonna be different from the actual uh, gradient across the entire data set. Uh, so there is gonna be some noise in noise of this mini batch, and that's actually helpful because that helps you get out of these local minima where you might get stuck. So uh, in practice, we use stochastic gradient descent, which is computing uh, the gradients over a mini batch and then optimizing. The learning rate alpha and the mini batch size M are also hyperparameters. Uh, hyperparameter optimization is a whole separate part of deep neural network training. Uh, it's actively being worked on. Uh, there's many different packages for HBO, uh, and you will probably see a few more examples of this as we go along. Uh, but remember that uh, we talked about hyperparameters yesterday. Uh, alpha and M are examples of hyperparameters in uh, deep neural networks and deep learning. So this just shows you uh, graphically, again, a cartoon of what happens when you change the learning rate. Uh, so as you might imagine uh, from the previous examples in 1D and 2D, uh, you could take a small learning rate, so a low, a low rate in blue shows what the curve might look like for your training process uh, as you increase uh, the number of training steps. Uh, if you have a very small step, then it's going to take you very long to converge, uh, so you have this very sort of slow training process. If you have a large lear learning rate uh, in these very complex surfaces, you can uh, sort of make very large steps that might take you to a very different part of the, the lost landscape. So uh, an extremely high learning rate might just end up in sort of bouncing around between different, uh, different points of your surface and you don't necessarily optimize to, to the right points. Uh, so that's what happens uh, with the uh, 
yellow. Uh, if you slightly decrease that learning rate, you might not quite uh, bounce off the surface as, as widely, uh, but you still will not uh, get into some of the deeper parts of the surface. So uh, you sort of plateau with uh, the green. And of course, uh, quote unquote, good learning rate is where you actually do get to uh, the, uh, the minimum that's the best possible minimum. Um, so you might be wondering what these landscapes look like. And here uh, we have an example of uh, the lost landscape uh, depicted in two dimensions for the VGT, uh, which is a popular uh, neural network uh, in the computer vision community. Uh, as you can see here, uh, it's sort of like the Grand Canyon. You have these very extreme uh, deep ravines and, and sharp uh, gradients. Uh, surfaces that descend very rapidly, but also have many, many, many different minima, uh, saddle points, and so on. So even in 2D, uh, which is, or I guess 3D uh, is sort of what we're trying to show here, uh, you can have very complex surfaces, but imagine this in millions of dimensions. Uh, it can be very difficult to, to optimize these. Uh, so there are many different variants of stochastic gradient descent. Uh, this is a, an introductory uh, course or an introductory lecture on this, so I won't be able to do all these different methods, uh, but, but rest assured that you can have uh, many different approaches to optimizing uh, this particular process. Uh, there's uh, stochastic gradient descent plus momentum and various other uh, variants, but for, for beginners and, and to get started, uh, Atom is a good place to start. Uh, these are standardly available in, in many different packages uh, and you can essentially choose these essentially with just a single flag. Uh, so I wouldn't bother with uh, the details at this point. Uh, as, you, as you go through your deep learning research, you might uh, want to try different variants. Uh, the key idea of, of this optimization process is backpropagation. Um, We've seen how we can update uh, the weights, but of course we have many, many layers and uh, there are weights for every single layer. Uh, and, and the sort of backbone of this entire process is essentially the chain rule of calculus, uh, which is to propagate the gradients through your network uh, all the way from outputs to bits. Uh, so this is essentially the depiction of what that looks like for um, X, Y, Z, and W. Uh, you can expand this out for any number of layers as you like. Uh, so back propagation allows the propagation of uh, the gradients through, uh, through the network all the way from the outputs to the inputs. Uh, it's a very uh, sort of clever and efficient way of, of doing the optimization. Uh, and as you can see from this, uh, you probably have lots of problems uh, when your gradients explode or, or go down to zero. Uh, so there's problems with vanishing gradients and exploding gradients, uh, and there's ways to get around that as well. Uh, which I won't get into in, in this particular talk, but we might uh, hear more from David Hall uh, later today. So the key uh, part of this uh, back propagation process is that uh, observation functions need to essentially propagate their derivatives, uh, and we don't want these neurons to all essentially die or have zero gradients because then uh, the information is not propagated back through. Uh, so we have to design um, networks and, and connections in ways in which uh, the uh, information in the gradients can actually pass through the entire network. So how do we actually monitor the training process of neural networks? Uh, we talked a little bit about this yesterday with machine learning uh, methods. Uh, the same ideas hold for deep learning as well. Uh, there are problems with uh, underfitting and overfitting. Uh, the terminology uh, was already defined yesterday. Underfitting is where you haven't actually fit the characteristics of the model. Overfitting is when you've essentially uh, over-optimized your training data and you don't actually generalize. So what we see here are the training curves on a training data set. Of course, this is a cartoon. Things are uh, a little more complex in reality. But what we're seeing here is that uh, underfitting is on the left where the training error and validation error are quite close. This is the initial part of your training process where uh, your model weights have not really been optimized to their true uh, values and uh, you're still having fairly high losses, fairly high errors. Uh, but as you, as you go through your training process, uh, you start decreasing your loss and at some point you start to uh, essentially overfit to the training data. And, and your errors on your validation uh, data set are actually increasing. And this is where you have uh, essentially overfit. 
um, and the, the goal of the training process is to, is to stop right before you start overfitting so that you can generalize to uh, unseen data. So once again, uh, the characteristics of uh, underfitting are that the training loss is high. Uh, so the ways in which you might get around this are uh, check that your model architecture is suitable. Uh, of course, that's a fair and vague term, any ways of doing that. Um, you might want, want to check your learning rate. Um, uh, it might be too small. Uh, so you have to train longer in some cases. Uh, and there are various other hyperparameters that need to be changed as well. Uh, of course, these are fairly uh, general statements and, and there are specifics on exactly how you, how you go about doing this for different types of tasks and problems. Uh, but this is the uh, overall sort of overarching idea. The training and validation curves are, are too similar uh, is sort of the first indication of uh, underfitting. So uh, this is probably one thing to keep in mind as you diagnose your uh, training process. And then overfitting is, is the regime where your training loss is, is low, but your validation loss is high. So how you might go about dealing with overfitting is to question uh, yourself on whether you've actually provided enough data for the, the, the learning process. Uh, and if you don't have sufficient data, which is actually the case in, in many of our problems, and, and specifically, I mean, old data, we're talking about supervised learning, uh, you do need training examples and, and labeled data. So uh, labeled data is scarce and, and hard to find in, um, in the climate sciences and various other earth sciences, because it's very laborious to, to create these training data sets. So you might have to employ data augmentation techniques. There are many clever ways of doing that, uh, which I think we'll get to as we go through the week. Uh, you might also have to change your learning rate as you go through uh, the training process. There are different uh, learning rate schedules and uh, there's a whole body of research on what, what are the ways in which we, you might change your learning rate. Uh, other hyperparameters might also have to be changed. Uh, regularization techniques might have to be employed. Uh, and finally, you might, uh, after doing all of that, discover that your uh, model is just way too complex uh, and overparameterized, and so you might reduce model complexity uh, because if you have an extremely complex model, it's likely that you can uh, overfit to your training data because there's so many free parameters. Uh, so the key goal of the learning process is to close this generalization gap, which is to reduce the errors between the validation and training so that you push this particular loss point to the right as much as possible. So early stopping is uh, essentially a way of uh, speeding up your training process. So you, you stop training as soon as you notice that your validation errors and your training errors are deviating from each other. Uh, and there's, there's ways in which you can diagnose this. So I'll pause again for a couple of minutes to take any questions before I move on to connectivity and model architecture. Uh, all right, so deep learning is a subset of machine learning and machine learning is a subset of AI. That's, uh, I think David talked about that yesterday. Uh, in practice, the types of functions that deep neural networks do well on and poorly on. Uh, we'll see more examples of this as we go through the day. Uh, my goal today is to introduce deep learning and um, some of the details of exactly how you go about choosing these things uh, will come uh, essentially through experience and, and various other examples. We already got to this question before. All right, so maybe I'll, I'll switch back to the presentation so uh, we can address some more questions towards the end. Uh, Okay, so connectivity and model architecture. Um, so this sort of came up in, in, uh, in one of the questions earlier, which is, uh, can you have sparse versus dense neural networks? The examples that I showed so far were dense networks where every single neuron is connected to all components of the inputs. Uh, but of course, you can also have sparse connections where every neuron is only affected by a limited um, number of inputs. So you have a receptive field uh, in this particular case, the uh, dark black lines show the receptive field uh, and, and the receptivity is three. Uh, and then you can also have another way of sparsifying these networks, which is to uh, share parameters. So every single weight is not independent, but they're all tied together. 
Uh, and why would you do this? Uh, well, one, one motivation is that these are extremely computationally expensive. So if you have clever ways of uh, reducing that complexity, uh, that's helpful. But also importantly, uh, these can be ways in which you can uh, incorporate domain knowledge and ideas and knowledge and characteristics of your data sets and, and the domains that you're dealing with into these networks. So uh, this is sort of where designing uh, neural network architectures and properties of these networks can be extremely helpful. And we'll see how convolutional neural networks essentially leverages some of those ideas. So moving on to uh, CNNs or convolutional neural networks, uh, this cartoon uh, shows what, what convolutions are. Uh, convolutions essentially is having uh, kernels of weights uh, that slide across the inputs. Uh, and what is achieved here is sparse connectivity because uh, we're only focusing on uh, certain regions and the weights are tied because all, all of the weights are essentially the same uh, for this particular filter as it moves through the entire uh, sort of field of vision. So we achieve both the idea of sparsity and uh, the idea of tight weights by, by having convolutions. Uh, now you might ask, what are convolutions? So convolutions are essentially uh, the matrix multiplications of these weights with the inputs x. So uh, on, on the top, left, top right, you see sort of the, the, the depiction of this. You have inputs x1 through x13, and, and you have these weights w1, w2, w3, w4, as they convolve with, say, a particular part of your image or your data set, x3, x4, x5, and x6. Uh, you have this, this dot product, which gives you the function or the feature f. Um, and so the convolution process is essentially the matrix multiplication as you slide these weights over the inputs. So what, what are the characteristics of these convolutions? Uh, they are translation equivariant by construction. What that means is that no matter which part of the image has the features that you care about, they're captured because of these convolutions essentially sliding through. So if, you're think, if you think in terms of, uh, let's say a climate science example, or you're trying to detect a hurricane in a, in a large data set, uh, it doesn't matter where that hurricane is in your data, uh, the convolutions will be able to detect, detect these features uh, essentially uh, anywhere in that particular image. Uh, there are obviously some caveats to that, which we'll get to later on, but uh, CNNs achieve this uh, translation equivariance. Uh, there's many other types of uh, invariances and equivariances that can be uh, constructed and baked into these networks, and, and that's a whole body of, of research on its own. Uh, and that's where domain scientists can provide uh, ideas in order to uh, design clever network architectures uh, geometric uh, properties, topological properties, uh, differential equations that are satisfied, uh, and various other constraints and so on can be uh, incorporated into these networks. And, and that's sort of what falls under the category of uh, physics informed machine learning or knowledge guided machine learning, which is an extremely active area of research and, and potentially uh, extremely helpful for uh, scientific applications. So moving on, uh, just again, sort of, uh, uh, the convolution operation, uh, and that gives you a feature map or an activation map. Uh, once again, uh, just showing you what this looks like for uh, a real example, a small real example. If you have an image that's 32 by 32 uh, in spatial dimensions, let's say, and has uh, three input layers uh, in a computer vision example, that might be red, blue, green. Uh, and you have a filter that's five by five by three, uh, once you convolve that over all of your uh, spatial locations, you end up with this activation map, which is 28 by 28 by one. Now you could do that with uh, six different filters and you would get six different activation maps, uh, as you see on the right here. Uh, these different colors represent the different maps. So as you can imagine, as you go through these networks, uh, you get uh, you reduce the size, uh, dimensionality, but you can increase uh, the number of activation maps by having as many filters as you like. Uh, why would we want to do something called pooling? Uh, pooling is essentially the process by which you uh, reduce the size of your data uh, by either averaging or, or picking the maximum. Uh, pooling layers essentially replace the input by a summary statistic. Um, and, and these are helpful because they reduce the complexity of, of the data and uh, essentially make the training process uh, actually doable. Uh, 
uh, and, and they also make it invariant to small local translations of the input. So uh, if you had say an activation on the top left versus the bottom right, it would essentially give you the same result. Uh, and so fluctuations and, and small translations are uh, essentially made invariant by having the pooling layers uh, besides the computational advantages. Uh, here is an example of strider convolutions. So there are cases where you don't necessarily need to uh, have convolutions over every single uh, part. Uh, having uh, convolutions with a stride of one, you might you might take steps uh, that that uh, essentially again reduces the dimensionality of the data sets, uh, the dimensionality of the feature maps, and then um, provides you with the outputs that uh, can go through the right pooling functions. So. Putting all this together, and, and apologies for sort of the, the dump of uh, information, it is a pretty complex topic, but we do have to uh, sort of skim over the, the key ideas and then get into the details as we go along. Uh, you end up with something like this, which is uh, a deep neural network with many different layers. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a computer vision example. So we have an input image. Uh, let's say it's 224 by 224 by 3. You can have a bunch of convolutions and pooling layers that gives you uh, a reduced dimensionality and so on. You keep going through these different uh, blocks, uh, in this case, block one and so on. And finally, you have uh, a flattening and then dense layers. This would be the sort of classic example of a CNN network architecture. Uh, I do know that uh, David Hall is gonna talk about a whole range of different types of architectures uh, later today. And we'll see uh, many different networks and many different uh, applications of these CNNs uh, as we go along. Uh, so yes, there, there is a lot more to this, uh, and, and David will get to that. Uh, but I just wanted to give a, a, a quick overview of the types of networks. There's recurrent neural networks and uh, modeling time. Uh, I've only looked at spatial examples so far, but of course we do want to model time series and, and do predictions and forecasting, uh, which I believe the next talk is about. This transpose convolutions, uh, which is used for upsampling uh, when we talk about GANs and various other architectures, uh, we'll see examples of that. Uh, you have skip connections, uh, which is helpful for training very large networks. We talked about uh, you know, the grid exploding or going down to zero and there's clever ways to avoid that. So you have skip connections. Uh, there's geometric deep learning, uh, which has various different properties of these uh, 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 domains that you're dealing with, whether it's uh, spherical convolutions, for example, uh, for dealing with data sets on the sphere. Uh, modeling different types of groups and flows for say PDEs or uh, domains that have other types of governing equations. You can incorporate constraints. Uh, if you're doing things with material science or chemistry, you might look at rotational equivariance and various other types of properties uh, and, and many more ideas of uh, how you might go about designing these neural networks. Uh, we do have a few minutes and I'll, I'll very quickly uh, give some highlights of uh, how we might go about demystifying uh, this black box uh, of deep learning. Uh, one is to visualize features. Uh, we have talks later through the week where uh, we'll get into the details of how to actually understand what these networks are learning, weights, uh, what are the features that are uh, moving from, from one layer to the next. Uh, this has been done for computer vision. This is also being done actively right now for the earth sciences. There are several great papers coming out from uh, various different groups on how we might uh, use feature visualization techniques and, and interpretability, te interpretability techniques to understand what these networks are learning. Uh, but for computer vision, uh, what's been shown is that uh, initially you learn um, high level features such as edges and blobs. And as you go through the, these different layers, you start to build uh, on top of that. So you have these compositional ideas where you're building uh, texture uh, from these edges and blobs. And then uh, you might build uh, shapes of different kinds. And then finally get to these very complex uh, characteristics such as you know, faces and clocks and streets or in, our, in the case of the art sciences, maybe uh, different uh, atmospheric phenomena or other, other types of characteristics of data going on to object classes. Uh, so once again, as I mentioned, there's uh, distill.pub, which uh, essentially distills all of the work going into uh, many of these areas that are essentially whole separate areas of research and deep learning, like interpretability, feature visualization, uh, et cetera. I highly recommend uh, checking out some of the 
um, the, the posts here, uh, they do explain uh, very succinctly and also uh, with, with a lot of different examples, how you might go about interpreting uh, and understanding what these networks are learning. So coming back to where we started, uh, deep neural networks, uh, hopefully you've uh, seen how they are parametric, nonlinear, hierarchical representation learning functions. Uh, and the highlighted parts here uh, are the things that I tried to unpack through the last uh, 45 minutes or so. And then we've also seen how you might uh, optimize these using stochastic gradient descent uh, and how to end domain knowledge into them uh, using invariances and stationarity and various other properties. Uh, of course, that's sort of the, the high level theory and background of deep learning, but the, the real challenges are in uh, the training processes and uh, the practical ways in which you go about uh, doing this. Um, so the, I'll just give a couple of tips here, but of course there's many, many more. Uh, so one of the things you might do is to check the loss at the beginning of the training. Uh, in, in, a, in a simple example, like say a classification of 10 different classes, uh, initially you expect your loss to be something like minus log of one over C, in this case, one over 10. Um, so there's sort of these simple uh, sanity checks uh, and you might have any regularization for these checks. Uh, the next is you wanna try to overfit on a small data set. So uh, because these networks have such large capacity, you should be able to overfit on a small a uh, tiny data set. So the first sort of goal is to train on a very small data set and, and make sure that you're able to overfit on that. If, and if you cannot, there's probably some bug uh, in your code or some, some issue that needs to be dealt with. Uh, there's many, many more uh, practical tips and uh, a great blog is by Andre Karpati on a recipe for training neural networks. Uh, this is uh, of course one of many different uh, examples of where you can sort of learn these tips and tricks on training neural networks. Uh, I think this cartoon sort of sum summarizes uh, the whole training process for machine learning and deep learning uh, from X XKCD. Uh, this, this is your machine learning system, which is this, this large pile of data uh, with these tools. You pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra and then collect answers on the other side. And uh, what if the answers are wrong? You just keep stirring until they start looking right. Uh, but of course, this stirring is damn hard. Um, so I think I'll stop right there. Uh, thank you, and I'll take any questions. All right, so there's a question on uh, how is deep learning related to unsupervised learning? Uh, I didn't get into the details of supervised versus unsupervised, but of course, within deep learning, you do have uh, supervised, unsupervised, and semi-supervised learning. Uh, the key difference is supervision, you have training data. Uh, semi-supervision, you might have a little bit of training data. Unsupervised is uh, where you let, essentially don't, don't have specific examples uh, in your training data and you let the network uh, figure out what might be uh, characteristic properties. Um, GANs are an example of uh, where you can have um, generative models to, to do unsupervised learning. There's many other types of unsupervised uh, deep learning methods as well. This is a good question. Whether models are highly computationally expensive and so are deep learning models. How would deep learning have an edge over physical models? So the key point here is that uh, Training a deep learning model is expensive, but once you've trained the model, inference is very quick. So uh, applying your deep learning model that's already trained on uh, you know, new data sets that come in is extremely fast. So it's cheap to, uh, to apply a deep learning model in inference mode. Uh, the training process itself can be expensive. Uh, so the idea or the motivation is that if you have uh, good ways of training these deep learning models, and if you have good techniques to help them generalize, then they potentially faster than traditional uh, uh, computation models that require you to compute every single time uh, you have uh, a new simulation or a new uh, data point that you want to create. What is the simplest way to choose hyperparameters? Uh, well, you begin uh, essentially with random hyperparameters and then you optimize it. Um, 
You could also take a pre-trained network where the hyperparameters are already optimized for a particular problem. It turns out that in many cases, because these networks have such large complexity, uh, you can actually have pre-trained networks performing fairly well on your uh, task and then you optimize it a little more using the examples that you have from your particular task. Uh, that's what, what's known as transfer learning. Uh, and I, I'm, I believe there are a few talks uh, later this week that will delve into some of the details. It is quite intuitive to use CNN on spatial problems such as images. Do you know or can suggest of any approaches to use CNNs for time series problems? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, you can essentially think of uh, convolutions in the time dimension as well, so 3D convolutions. So if you had 2D in space and 1D in time, you could do 3D convolutions. Uh, this is actually quite routinely done for uh, various different uh, types of applications, uh, including for super resolution and uh, other tasks. So I think David will also show you some examples of where you can convolve uh, in the time dimension as well. So CNNs, uh, I've only shown you examples in 2D, but they're extendable to 3D and 4D and so on. Can you talk about an example of deep learning applied to Earth system sciences that's already in use? That's a great question. Uh, we do have uh, applications in detection of events. Uh, so just as we saw uh, in, in the talk today, you can uh, detect you know, things like faces and cats and dogs and bicycles. But this is also being used for detecting uh, extreme weather events, such as uh, hurricanes and atmospheric bursts and runs, um, various other phenomena. Uh, so yes, there, there are many applications of deep learning uh, that are actually operational today, uh, including, uh, as we'll see through the week, on designing parameterizations for climate models uh, and various other tasks. All right, uh, thank you, Karthik. Uh, we're we're going to now uh, take a 10 minute break uh, for those who keep uh, submitting questions and we'll, we'll uh, keep some for the restore them this afternoon for the panel. So, so we can uh, try to answer more of them. Uh, there, there will be, there's a lot of questions on applications. Uh, we're going to see more today and then throughout the week uh, about how people are using both machine learning and deep learning for all kinds of different earth, science, earth system science applications. So if you're curious, please uh, keep watching. So with that, uh, we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.